Louis Gov from GovCal Research. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Mate, we have got plenty to talk about. When I first reached out to you uh, a month or two ago, it was uh, maximum bearishness in China, and I wanted to get your take on China, given that your, you know, your wealth of experience in the country and observing the country for many, many years. Uh, but since since then, we have had a massive turnaround uh, in the fortune, not necessarily the fortunes of China, but massive turnaround in the equity market. We've seen uh, massive stimulus measures announced by the government. So, what what's your sort of take on it? Is the uh, is the stimulus measures the real thing? Uh, should we believe the equity market, which has rallied massively, or should we take caution from the pundits, who are all generally very skeptical of these announcements? Yeah, I think when you uh, reached out to me that the uh, mantra in China was ABC uh, for anything but China. And uh, three weeks later, here we are, and it's ABC all in by China. Um, and uh, so, look, uh, to go straight into it, you're absolutely right. I think pretty much everything I've read in, uh, in the past two or three weeks uh, falls into one of two categories. It's either... Uh, Number one, this is too little, too late. Uh, it's not enough. They, they need to do a lot more. Or option two, it's, oh, uh, they're panicking. It must mean that the situation really is even more dire than they've announced. Uh, things must really be terrible for them to, uh, to basically be bringing out the bazooka. Um, I think, you know, behind these statements is a simple reality is that nobody was positioned for this. Um, nobody at all was positioned for the kind of rally that, uh, that, that we've seen. Um, yeah. Now, is it for real? I think it is. Um, I think it is. And for me, the really the, the, the revelation of the past few couple of weeks was that, uh, you know, two and a half weeks ago, the Fed, or almost three weeks ago now, the, the Fed cut 50 basis points, the U.S. dollar fell and U.S. treasuries fell. So the markets were telling you that, hold on, you know, that, that this might not be the, the good move by the Fed. Meanwhile, if you look at China, the PBOC cut interest rates and the renminbi went up. Um, now, to me, this is what matters the most. Uh, the strength of the currency is giving you the direction of where we're heading. I think what people forget, um, um, you know, it's, it's easy to paint a doom and gloom picture uh, for China. I'm, I'm sure most of your listeners or viewers will, will have uh, heard the arguments many times, massive balance sheet recession, falling real estate prices. Um, uh, you know, incomes being hit, and all, all that stuff. Um, but against all this, we also have to acknowledge that today China is running trade surpluses of 80 billion US dollars a month. Uh, now, this is twice the trade surplus that any other country has ever run through history. Now, logically, with that kind of trade surplus, you should be seeing capital flow back into China, pushing up the exchange rate and pushing up local asset prices. But this hasn't happened uh, because... Basically, confidence has been crushed in China for a number of reasons that we can discuss. But again, I think most of the, most of the people are familiar with, with why uh, confidence has been crushed. Um, so, uh, you know, what is changing now, well, the big question is, are these measures enough to spur confidence? And the fact that the renminbi is going up leads me to believe that, that it is. Um, and so if you start to see either the 80 billion a month in trade surplus, you know, come back in by local asset prices and or uh, literally the trillions of dollars sitting outside China. You know, you look at U.S. dollar cash deposits in Hong Kong banks right now is roughly $1.2 trillion with a T. So there's $1.2 trillion sitting in cash accounts in U.S. dollars. Um, and if even just a fraction of that starts to make its way into asset prices, um, you know, the, it can move quickly. Now, the reality is that, you know, if you held on to Chinese equities this long, uh, like I have, through the pain, um, you're not letting go after a 20% pop. You know, you, you, wrote it, yep. you wrote it down. It's been super painful. And now here you are, you're owning an asset, if you own Chinese equities, you're owning an asset that is very, very attractively valued. You know, Chinese stocks are super cheap. They now have positive momentum, um, and they're being supported by policy. Uh, it was very obvious that the, the, the aim, first aim of policy was to get asset prices higher. So, with that in mind, you know, if you know who, who sells now, you know who, who's going to sell stocks when they have positive momentum, policy support, and they're undervalued. Um, 
The answer is nobody. So this thing is going to keep ripping. How um how tactical do you think the announcement was from the authorities? You mentioned just then that the U.S. had previously just cut interest rates. Uh, the general um, stock prices had fallen 50%. Sentiment was very, very bearish, uh, I think, from a global perspective. Global capital was near universally short China. Uh, and the measures that were – some of the measures that were implemented uh, – swap rates or lend, uh, cheap lending to buy stocks, uh, uh, opportunities for firms or state enterprises to buy back their shares at these very low levels. It seems very targeted towards almost instituting a short squeeze and, and really trying to strong arm the market into a change of narrative. Is, is that a deliberate timing ploy from the, from the authorities there? So I think there's two ways to look at it. Um, one way is to say, well, look, um, October 1st, you know, uh, today or yesterday, sorry, was China's 75th birthday. Uh, well, sorry, not China's 75th birthday. It was the 75th birthday of the announcement of the creation of the Chinese um, uh, Communist Republic uh, the, when basically Mao Zedong took power. So, you know, one way you could say is they wanted to create a feel good factor uh, ahead of the October 1st celebrations. This whole week in China, is one long celebration it's uh, national holidays and so you want to create feel good factor before this uh, so so that's one option the other option uh, and, and that's a distinct possibility by the way um but an, another probably more plausible explanation is that you know when you look at chinese policymakers historically they don't really care about stocks um what they've always cared about was the currency uh and they deeply care about the currency um even more so today that, you know, for the past seven, eight years, if you're a Chinese leader, you feel like the U.S. has been coming for you. Um, and so you, you look at your vulnerability of your economy and you think, OK, I import semiconductors and the U.S. has been attacking me there. I import energy. So I try to diversify my source of energy. I build up solar. I build up nuclear. I build pipelines into Russia. Uh, but really, the biggest vulnerability of the Chinese economy is that it still settles, up until recently, it was still settling the majority of its trade in U.S. dollars. So if ever the U.S. government decided to do to China what it did to Russia, what it did to Venezuela, what it did to Iran, what it did to Sudan, and cut cut it off from U.S. dollar trading system, uh, then trade could collapse into China and that would collapse the economy. Um, so, you know, the past really five, six years, the main focus has been how do we accelerate the de-dollarization of our trade the only way to do that is to have a strong currency, to have a strong bond market, to tell you know Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, South uh, South Africa, Australia, hey guys, let's settle our trade in renminbi rather than U.S. dollars. Uh, and in the process, um, you know the, the guys on the other side will only be willing to do this if the renminbi is a strong currency. So all this to say that if you look at the U.S. You know, it's pretty obvious to me that U.S. policymakers care first about the current, uh, first about the equity market, second about the bond markets, and then the currency can settle where it settles. As Treasury Secretary Connolly once told the Europeans, the U.S. dollar is our currency and your problem. Uh, well, in China, that order is completely reversed. Policymakers care first about the currency, second about the bond market, and then the equity market can settle where it settled. So as long as the Fed was tightening and the U.S. dollar was going up, this meant that Chinese policymakers didn't, didn't really have many levers to pull as their economy was slowing down. If your goal was to keep the renminbi strong, then you had to, you know, perhaps keep a somewhat tighter policy than, than you wanted. Um, so the fact that the Fed is now cutting, uh, that even though inflation is nowhere near 2% in the U.S., uh, and the fact that as the Fed cuts, the U.S. dollar goes down, this all of a sudden gives China a much wider uh, array of potential policies. So I don't think it's a coincidence that China's easing came a week after the Fed's easing. Um, but it does leave us yeah. into a world where all of a sudden, the number two economy in the world is, you know, following much easier fiscal and easier monetary policy. The number one economy in the world is following easier monetary policy. Uh, and I think after the US election, regardless of who wins, we'll see easier fiscal policy because every new president that comes in always spends more money. Um, 
So you're left with the two biggest economies in the world easing on the fiscal front, easing on the monetary policy front. Uh, this is highly reflationary. And then you can throw in for good measure interest rate cuts in Europe. You can throw in for good measure a strong yen because a weak yen is deflationary for the world and a strong yen is reflationary for the world. And all of a sudden, over the past few weeks, it looks like wherever you care to look, you got a bunch of reflationary forces, um, which if I'm sitting in Australia, I'd be pretty stoked about. I'm sitting in Canada, so we're not that bad. Yeah, absolutely. Outside. I mean, <laughs> so we're, we tend to yeah, be I mean, the, 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 the Aussie. The Aussie resources sector has been neglected entirely for the banks, and I think that trade is starting to unwind. You're starting to see a rotation from that financial yeah. sector into the into the commodity sector. It's been, it's been the same in Canada. On the equity RBC, markets, just RBC for one moment. So basically, what you're saying there is that. Sorry, I was going to say you're you're, you're saying that the, the the key point of this stimulus is to strengthen the the currency. So the the effect of that is to get the equity market up, to get the the money coming that's sitting offshore back into the into the local currency to to push that up. Just a question on the equity market: there has been previous years where you've seen massive rallies in the equity market based on on stimulus measures. Has there ever been a period where stocks have been this undervalued um, prior to a, a, a big stimulus measure like we're seeing? Um, yeah, I think if you look, uh, well, it's hard to compare, first of all, because the Chinese equity market has changed so much. The companies that are prevalent today, you know, the Alibaba's, the Tencent, et cetera, yeah. they, they were not listed in past cycles. Um, so if you go back to uh, 98, 99, uh, Chinese stocks were severely undervalued back then. They were super cheap, but it was mostly crap SOE companies, you know, that that, that made up the index. Um, yep. And and it was really, to be honest, it was uh, it wasn't even the banks. It was you know your and it wasn't even PetroChina. It was you know sort of crap conglomerates, Chinese conglomerates uh, that that made up the bulk of. But back then it was called the Red Chips Index and. You know, it was companies that did a little bit of everything and did everything badly. Um, so it's very hard to compare through time because the the, the, the index has, has changed so many times. But uh, no, look, Chinese stocks have been have been cheap before. Um, the, the history of the Chinese stock market, when you look at it, partly because of, uh, you know, the fact that policymakers really don't care about stocks. They actually only care about stocks typically when they get either way too cheap and it kind of becomes embarrassing so they feel they have to do something about it which is where we are today or they start to get too too expensive and you start to see too much frivolous speculation uh and then the government worries about it so what ends up happening is typically chinese stocks go nowhere for five to seven years then they go up 100 percent over 12 months and then the government says okay well so they do nothing for five or seven years the government sort of pushes them up very quickly, they go up 100% in 12 months. And then the government steps in and says, okay, that's enough. Party's over. Um, yeah. And then they go down 50%. And then after that, they go do nothing for five or seven years. And in my career, and you know, I'm 50 years old. Uh, in my career, I've seen this time and time again. Uh, and I think that's where we just started. We're 25% up in a move, uh, in a 100% move. On the question of FX, uh what does what do you think the US thinks about China's uh, uh, FX strategy? Does it is it happy to see China have a stronger yuan? yuan? Uh, is it happy to see uh, the US dollar depreciate against the yuan? And I ask that in the context of something I read from you. Um, I think you said something around that there could be a new Plaza Accord type situation uh, between the two countries that could be quite bullish for markets. I wonder if you could just go into that a little bit. Sure, absolutely. Well, um, it's a it's a tough question because there's so many different constituencies uh, in the United States, right? Um, and um, it's not obvious to me that the U.S. speaks with one voice on this. Um, so I think if you talk to people at the Fed, people at the Treasury, um, you know, people who are very uh, protective of the U.S.'s uh, reserve currency um, uh, dominance they might not be super keen for a big devaluation of the dollar against uh, the renminbi. However, if you listen to the people in the Trump campaign today, um, it's very obvious that their number one goal is to reindustrialize the United States, to bring manufacturing jobs back, 
and that this can't be done with an overvalued US dollar. Uh, in fact, that can only be done if the dollar devalues massively against the yen, de devalues massively against the renminbi. And that's what guys like Robert Lighthizer, um, who's Trump's uh, one of Trump's economic advisor, or Scott Bessent, who's supposed to be Trump's um, uh, treasury secretary, who's rumored to be Trump's treasury secretary if Trump is elected. That That's what they, they've been talking about. Um, now, you know, the, the, the framework through which this could happen, and I've, I've written a little, little bit about this indeed, is, um, you know, if you go back to the mid 80s, the US dollar was massively overvalued, just like it is today. And the Deutsche Mark and the yen would, you know, back then Germany and Japan were the two big industrial superpowers outside of the US. Um, th th those currencies were massively undervalued. So, you know, everybody sat down at the Plaza Hotel and uh, agreed a, a deal whereby. The renminbi, the, the renminbi wasn't even on, on the table back then. The yen and the Deutsche Mark would be pushed up and the dollar pushed down. And this led to an epic, epic boom from 1987, uh, 1985 to 87 until basically Germany walked out of the Plaza Accord and that triggered the crash of 87. But, you know, before then, commodities were shooting up. Uh, um, global growth was, was shooting up. And if you had, if you were in a country with a pegged currency to the US dollar, then the stock market of those countries like Taiwan, Korea, Hong Kong, went absolutely bananas. They went bananas because, um, you know, if you're gonna push the dollar down, then countries like Taiwan back then had no choice but to print a lot of money to try to keep up with the dollar as it went down. They didn't have the bond market to sterilize their FX intervention. And so before you know it, all that excess money was just driving up local asset prices, both real estate and equities. Um, so, you know, today I, you do hear people around uh, Trump talk of a new Plaza Accord. In fact, they even openly talk of a Mar-a-Lago Accord. They even put a name on it. Mar-a-Lago, of course, being Trump's hotel. Um, and, yep. and so, you know, if really Trump is elected and instead of bashing China, invites Xi Jinping to Mar-a-Lago in Florida and says, look, let's sit down, let's cut a deal. You agree to build a bunch of factories in the U.S. You tell BYD and Lee Autos and Long Home Machinery and wherever else to build factories in Ohio and Michigan, um, and you uh, you agree to buy a bunch of goods from the U.S. and you agree to revalue the renminbi. Then on my side, I'll take away you know the constraints on semiconductors uh, and I'll stop beating you up on tariffs. Let's shake on it. Um, well, if we get a deal like this, then you know, we'll go through an absolute epic boom on the world. Now, these are there's two massive ifs in this scenario, right? The first is if Trump is elected, yeah. which we'll find out in about a month. Um, if Trump is elected, and then number two, if he wants to do the Mar-a-Lago Accord. Now, I think the odds of him getting elected are, are decently high. Uh, I think they're better than 50-50. And I think that if he is elected, he will be looking for something for a deal because he, he sees himself as a deal maker. Um, but also because I think he realizes that um, if he is going to reindustrialize the United States, he can't do it under the present set of conditions with an overvalued U.S. dollar, uh, making it extremely hard for other countries to invest in, in the United States. So you'll need a deal. Um, and it might very well be in China's interest to, to strike that deal because, you know, China will be looking as well to, uh, you know, to, to something that boosts its own confidence. Um, now, such a deal would lead to an epic, epic boom in commodities, an epic boom in, uh, you know, Hong Kong stock prices, an epic boom across the Middle East. Whoever's got a peg currency to the U.S. dollar would uh, would go bananas. It sounds like um, something like that is is probably needed. After COVID, uh, there was a lot of talk about reengineering supply chains and reducing. Uh, reliance on China, but as you just spoke about before, China's producing even larger trade surpluses now, and I think the number you said was eighty billion a month. Yep. So that whole uh, reengineering of supply chains doesn't seem like it's changing capital flows at all. No, it. Uh, well, what's been interesting actually, so the gap. So what you've seen in um, in the past five years is you have seen. So you've seen China's trade surplus surge. But it hasn't been because of trade with the U.S. or not even trade with the EU. It's been really with trade with emerging markets. So today, you know, China exports more right. to Southeast Asia, to the ASEAN, to the other ASEAN, to the ASEAN countries, than it does to um, 
uh, to the United States. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's China's growth has occurred into new markets with new products. Uh, you know, and I, I know in Australia, it's starting to get the BYD cars, but cars is a great example of this, right? Three years ago, China basically didn't export cars. And today, China's the biggest car exporter in the world from, from again, no, nothing three years ago. And you could say the same thing for, um, for, uh, for uh, industrial robots. You could say the same thing for turbines. You could say the same thing for solar panels, for, um, uh, you know, heavy duty machinery, like earth moving equipment, etc. So, um, and so China is cracking open new markets with, with, with new products. Uh, and, and this is good for global trade. You know, all of a sudden people in Africa can afford an earth moving equipment that they piece of equipment that they couldn't afford before. Um, so all that, all that contributes to progress. Um, the, uh, but the supply, yeah, in terms of supply chains, it, I think the world in the past five years, the broader world has become more dependent on China than it's ever been. Um, and so, you know, reflecting this reality, if you're Trump, you might not like it. You might bemoan this reality, but it remains the reality nonetheless. So when you come into power, I think you can, you know, pretend the world is a certain way or you can deal with the reality that uh, that is looking at you in the eye. Said the, uh, the the situation is looking very bullish for commodities, which is obviously important for Australia, uh, and and many listeners will be interested in uh, what commodities it might be most bullish for. So let's maybe chat a little bit about the commodity sector. Traditionally, when China stimulates, the uh, Australia benefits from higher iron ore prices, and you've seen a big rally in iron ore prices over the past few weeks. Do you think that's a a, a standard playbook for this? Uh, particular stimulus package. Um, I know that China has tried not to reignite the property boom um, over the past couple of years. They've I'm tried to sure. let that slowly Actually. deflate. And sorry, talk sorry. to me about that then. No, no, go ahead. Well, um, uh, I don't think this this um, I, I don't. You know, we had the property booms we had in China between 2000 and 2020 uh, were really on an epic scale. Um, you know, it's uh, the amount of construction, you know, China poured more concrete in 10 years than the entire United States did in the whole 20th century. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd love to tell you they're going to do that again, you know, r run out and buy Fortescue. Uh, yeah, that's not the reality of the situation on the ground. You know, the, yes, they've cut interest rates and yes, they've, uh, uh, they've made it easier to get mortgages and, and yes, they're, they're, making it easier for people to, to buy a second home. Um, but I think the, the main aim be, be behind all of this is actually to um, to flog all the, the excess building that was done over the, the previous decade. Not so much encourage the, the building of new towers and the building. So, uh, you know, in the past, when China stimulated, you, did two, you bought Fortescue and you bought LVMH. Uh, okay. And... You don't need to bother with buying, you know, Chinese stocks or doing anything in China. Um, I, I don't think that's the case today. I think if you want to participate in the boom of China today, you actually have to go out and buy Chinese stocks. Because what they're trying today to do, they're actually not trying to ramp up their property price. They're actually not trying to ramp up construction. They're actually trying to ramp up uh, equity prices. Um, and the telling sign of this was... You know, they came out and said, look, if companies want to buy back their stock, uh, you know, the, this, we, we can provide margin for it. And before, the uh, stock buybacks were really frowned upon. The government wanted people, the, the companies to take the money and invest it, uh, not do financial engineering. Um, but uh, here they made it easier for people, for individuals to do margin loans to buy stocks, and they made it easier for companies to borrow money to buy back stock. So that's, you know, that's your tell. Uh, and yeah, again, I'd love to tell you rush out and buy iron ore. This is going to be a boom like all the previous ones. But it, sorry, it feels different. Well, no, that that was the uh, that was the point of my question. I was I was getting at that. Is this 
is this the yeah. same as previous uh, stimulus or, or do we need to think about <laughs> the, the flows of, of money a little bit differently? And you, and you said you're bullish on commodities. Are, are there different commodities like copper or aluminium that you're sort of more focusing on rather than that sort of infrastructure play like iron ore? Yeah, I, I am. I do remain bullish commodities, but the, but the reality, of course, uh, there's very different supply and demand dynamics for the various commodities. So, you know, I think today you look at the supply dynamic for copper, it's very different than that for an iron ore. Um, and, yeah, you know, there's, there's a lot of iron ore in the world. Um, and and extracting more iron ore for, from current mines is, is not is not that challenging. Um, the copper situation is... is is nowhere near as plentiful, so so that to me seems uh, seems perhaps like a better play, uh, not only on you know China's cyclical upswing, but on, uh, on the global cyclical upswing. All the while acknowledging that you know in China, copper is is used for two things in China. It's it's used of course to you know build and plumbing etc. And it's used for the electronics and all the things that we know we uh, copper is used for in the electric vehicles and the uh, the in, the electrification of everything. So, but it's also you. Copper in China is also a financial metal, <laughs> in a way that you know, if you have copper in a warehouse, the the banks will lend against that. Um, so it's a very easy metal to margin. So there's always a big incentive when things accelerate in China. You know, there's there's an incentive for all the commodity traders and and even the corporates themselves, the, the construction companies, etc to perhaps ship in more copper than they need because if they just have it sitting, like they buy more than they need and the price goes up, good. You know, they make money. Um, um, and, and if the price goes down, well, they can always leverage it up um, and wait for the price to come back because the banks do lend against copper. It is, a, again, it's like gold or silver. It's a financial metal as well. Right. Um, so when China stimulates, copper is usually, you know, not not a bad place to start. And what, what are your thoughts on aluminium? I know that China has some issues with bauxite supply uh, and they import the majority of it from Guinea and, and Australia um, and their, yep. their grades are, are running low there. And obviously aluminium is needed for the, the transmission build out. Uh, do you have any specific thoughts on that, Mark? Yeah, no, I think, uh, I, you know, if, if copper's first and, and iron ore last, I'd put aluminium in the middle. Um, and uh, yeah, to your point, you know, a, a lot, a lot, most most of the box that has to be shipped over. You know, shipping costs are going up. Um, the um, you know shipping shipping rates have actually uh, you know been been trending higher. So that's that's usually a pretty good sign for aluminum. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, th I think that that sector should be fine. To be honest. Um, yeah, but when it comes to commodities. And, um what about the steel industry in general? There, there were... uh, there's so much overcapacity, right? Yeah. Um, there's, uh, you know, China's now a, a big exporter of steel. Um, one of one of my rule of thumbs is you don't want to compete with China on things because they have an ability to take more pain than anybody else. Um, they can cut prices. They can, you know squeeze their own labor um and you know china's a huge steel producer now do you want to compete with that it's you know to to compete with china you you have to produce something that's a much much higher quality and the reality is you know the the improvements you've seen on pretty much every industry in china and again, we're talking cars before, but you, steel is the same. The idea that you would want to drive a Chinese car five years ago, you would have been laughed out of a room. But today, everybody's like, oh, these cars are great. Huh? Same with specialty steels. Like, you know, so competing with China is very tough. Very, very tough. So, you, you know, yeah. But for me, the, like the elephant in the room when it comes to commodities is energy. Because uh, that's the one that really matters uh, economically. You know, we, we all consume energy every day. You know, how much copper do I use on a daily basis? I mean, I use copper. It's in, it's in the very computer I'm talking to you through. But it's, uh, you know, I, I don't consume copper every day. Um, so uh, the, the real elephant in the room is energy. And I tend to believe that I look at the energy set up today. Uh, and 
you know, nobody has been that uh, energy. You look at Cushing in Oklahoma right now is that the storage is empty. The USSPR is very, very low. It's like a 30 year low. <laughs> Investors have record short energy. They've never been this short. Uh, and all this against a backdrop where China's stimulating, the US is stimulating, yen is going up. To me, that seems crazy. Um, I think we, we seem primed for a potential spike in energy prices. And then from there, you know, usually when energy prices go up, all commodity prices go up because most commodities are energy transformed in one way or another. Uh, you know, roughly half the cost of extracting gold out of the ground now is energy. Um, so if energy prices go up, all of a sudden maybe it's, you know, not, not as profitable for gold mines to take, uh, or copper mines to take stuff out of the ground. They do a little less of it. So the price goes up. You know, invariably, energy drives all the other commodity prices. Um, it, and I, it seems to me that we're on the verge of, of, well, I, of I was, a big rebound in energy prices. I, I was saving my energy question uh, to to one of the last ones just because I've been a, a big bull on energy for, for some time. My portfolio is getting increasingly overweight on energy as, the, as painful, the price huh? goes down for precisely those reasons you've just said. And oil, the oil, the gold oil price ratio is now at, at near historic highs. So, um, you know, I, I, I do, I, I do agree. One question I had on that is, is the, I guess, a big part of the 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 weakness or the bearish story on oil is the slowdown that we've seen in China over the over the past couple of years. Just wondered what your take was on how much of that was cyclical versus uh things like you know people are talking about the energy transition i don't buy it personally um i, I think china are just hedging their bets and trying to build as much energy sources as they can uh versus things like lng trucks that are taking demand away from diesel and stuff like that are, are these secular effects or is it purely a cyclical slowdown in in uh, oil demand in china so i i think you know we've blamed most people you know Look, I, I came into the year bullish energy, and indeed, it's been a very disappointing year. So you're forced to think, okay, what did I miss? And when you read the general media, everybody lays the blame at China's feet. It's like, oh, you know, if energy hasn't worked, it's because China's been disappointing and growth has been weak, et cetera. But meanwhile, you look at China's import numbers, and they've been good. Um, you know, August, again, was a new record high for, for a month of August for, for China. Um and it was higher than the previous August, um, it, the, or any other August. It was better than expected. But yet August was very August and September were very ugly for energy. And everybody's like, oh, it's China, it's China. Uh, but I don't think it is. Like the numbers don't tell that. That's just the narrative that's out there. It's people see weakness in China, yeah. they see weakness in energy, and the temptation is to link the two. But I'm not. It's not obvious to me that the, the two are linked. Instead, uh, I think that you've seen different things. You've seen massive destocking in the United States. Uh, again, I mentioned it earlier, but you know, Cushing, Oklahoma, storage is at record lows. Um, so you've seen, on the one hand, massive destocking in, in China. I also tend to believe that you know, if you're Iran, if you're Venezuela, and you think, okay, Trump may be getting elected in a few weeks, um, and when Trump is elected, he's going to go back to enforcing the United Nations um, embargo uh, on our oil trade. So if I'm Iran right now, I'm probably selling everything I can um, uh, on every dark ship, yeah. which brings me to uh, the, the part that nobody talks about. But if you look through the official data, the the one market that has been disappointing is not China. It's actually India. Uh, India's oil imports have been very weak when you put it in, in relation to the fact that India's had the fastest growing major economy in the world. Uh, the stock market's been ripping. Um, India should should be consuming a lot more oil, um, given everything else that's going on in the economy. So that leaves you with two possible conclusions. The first is uh, all the great numbers out of India are false, and its energy use is the real indicator, and India is not doing as well as expected. Or number, two, and I don't believe that that's the answer. Or number two, India has been buying a whole lot of oil from Iran. Um, you know, and from Russia, uh, from dark ships yep. um, at a discount, uh, and therefore isn't there on the market buying it at the good price. And so 
the real culprit, everybody blames China, but I think the real culprit is India that's been undercutting the market, buying all this illegal oil from Iran uh, and from and from Russia. Uh, and I'm, I'm not blaming India because if somebody comes to you, if you're India, you're a poor country, and somebody comes to you and says, hey, I'll sell you oil at a massive discount. Um, you know, if I'm Modi, my duty is to my own citizens. Um, and so he takes the deal. Um, but that's, I think, where the weakness comes from. Um, so that leaves you with, you know, a few things. First, if the Russia-Ukraine war at some point ends, uh, Russia will be in less of a, you know, urgent need to slash its uh, its price. You know, right now Russia just needs to sell oil to pay for its war, um, and it's taking any price. And they, you know, the whole yep. India, China, literally have Russia over a barrel. Um, and then the the other one is Iran. Um, and here, you know, the big question mark is in the coming days: is Israel going to just take out Iran's um, uh, oil production capacity because if Iran can't sell oil, then I think economically speaking, the regime crumbles. Uh, the, they'll be they won't be able to yeah. pay their policemen. And they won't be able to pay their um, their army. So the reason Israel could never take out Iranian oil was mm-hmm. that they had Hezbollah right on their border um, with missiles planted their way. But now that Hezbollah has been decapitated. You know, does Israel start to think there's a window of opportunity here where we can crush Iran for good? Um, and should we take it? Um, if that's where we're heading now, then perhaps, uh, you know, we could have oil s- spike up very, very quickly. Do you think that happens in the lead up to a U.S. election? I mean, you mentioned that the U.S. are running down their inventories and that's, you know, in my view, uh, you know, clearly to keep gas prices nice and low ahead of an election, and not not to stir up any any issues there and stir up any yep. inflationary concerns. China's probably refilling their in- inventories with with prices this low. Do you think uh, Israel gets permission to to launch a strike uh, one month no, ahead of think, an election? I don't think it gets permission, but but Netanyahu, the way he's been speaking, doesn't seem to me to be the permission seeking kind. Um, I think he he probably he probably thinks I've got an opportunity here. I don't know when I'll have it again. Um, and by the way, he may also think yes, if I attack Iran now, oil price spikes to 120 bucks, and yes, that means Kamala Harris loses the election. But would I rather deal with Kamala Harris or would I rather deal with Donald Trump? I think if you're Benjamin Netanyahu, you'd rather deal with Donald Trump, who's been far more pro-Israeli uh, than than Kamala Harris has. So. For him, yep. you know, sc- screwing over Kamala Harris may be uh, a side benefit that uh, that tilts tilts the decision even further to- towards, you know, basically taking out the entire Iranian uh, oil industry. Very interesting. All right, let's um, let's finish off on gold. I guess it's tangentially uh, um, linked to, to the, the situation in the Middle East at the moment with the geopolitical tensions. But really, gold's had a, a big run this year. I think it's up um, off the top of my head. It's up about thirty percent since this since the start of the year. Do you think the run continues? I'm, I've, I've become more cautious. I've advised people to take some profits around this level. Um, what, what's what's the the, the Gavcal view? Yeah, look, we've been very bullish gold for a long time, um, but you know, thirty percent is a lot uh, in one year for gold. Um, it's, yep. uh, it's. I think it's one of the best years on record. Um, so, uh, meanwhile, what's been interesting is if you look at the other precious metals, the platinum, the palladium, the uh, and, uh, the silver, they've they've done nowhere near as good. Now, I think the reason behind that is one of the big drivers for gold. Uh, is central bank buying. You know, obviously China has been a big buyer, the Chinese central bank, but also the Thai central bank, the Saudi central bank, the Indonesian central bank. Um, you know, I, to, to be honest, the, the seizing of, you know, the, the Russian assets and the Russian bonds, the the, the Russian treasury bonds, um, freaked out a lot of people. Uh, and I think a lot of uh, yeah. a lot of central banks said, okay, I, I maybe I have too much bonds and not, not enough gold. In a world in which things become very uncertain, there's something to be said for just you know gold bars in, in my safe, and and this is where a lot of, of central banks are now heading. Now, 
does this change? I'm not sure it does, right? Um, you know, I think this only changes if all of a sudden the yields on U.S. Treasuries are so compelling that it's like, oh, you know what? I can make seven, eight, nine percent a year. I don't want to give that up for for the safety of running gold bars. Um, so I think until you see another massive leg down on the U.S. Treasury market, um, yeah. gold will remain decently bid. Um, now. You know, within the precious metal space, you know, could they start to be a rotation? You might have seen that this weekend, the, uh, the Russian central bank said, hey, we're going to stop buying gold. We're going to buy silver. We're going to buy pl uh, platinum instead. Um, so maybe, you know, if you start seeing some of that rotation, maybe the others start to work. Um, I'm, I'm bullish all precious metals, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. I think another thing to consider is that uh, Chinese investors have been huge buyers of gold because, again, they had so little confidence yep. in their own economy and in their own market. Uh, and you know, what if gold if is what is gold if not an expression of a lack of conf of confidence? So now that China is stimulating, now that uh, you know the Chinese stock market's ripping higher, that could be one purchaser of gold that disappears. All of a sudden, the Chinese Investor says, "Hey, I'll buy stocks. They're they're doing well now. Uh, I don't need to buy gold anymore." Um, so something to consider. Um, bottom line, I you know, gold's had a good rip. Uh, could it pause for a few months as some of the speculative money moves into Chinese equities and into other Asian equities? That that to me seems a pretty high odds scenario. Uh, so for an investor, yeah. for a listener who's got a three month, six month view, I wouldn't rush into gold. For a listener that's got a five-year view, you know, then just continue buying a little bit every quarter uh, or every time it dips, you just buy some. So you remain secularly bullish on on, on the gold yes. trade. There was one question I did want to ask you um, just before we, we, we wrap up uh, on the energy side of things, uh, just on, on coal. Um, I've... I've you know, got some coal stocks in the in the portfolio. I've talked about them and recommended them to subscribers. I they seem to be incredibly either. cheap, no. based on. Yes, yes. Good. Um, so it, they still seem to be incredibly cheap, based on the the fact that China is going to be consuming thermal emit coal for another 10, 20, 30 years, and there's no real um, substitute for that. Just wondering what your views were on the the, the coal sort of demand on in in China and whether that's going away anytime soon. So I, I own white I, I own Whitehaven coal, um, and I, that's but that's my only coal name. But um, uh, partly because it's one of the most efficient it's a good producers. One. Sorry, yeah, it's a good one. Uh, it's one it's of the most efficient one. producers. Yeah. And look, I really love the fact that you have. I think today a company like Whitehaven uh, benefits greatly from other people's stupidity. Uh, specifically, you know, with all these stupid ESG rules etc every, every company is trying to to look out green itself and and position itself for oh look at me i'm so clean so i've gotten rid of all my coal assets um and so you know why do you even get to pick up you know companies for literally pennies on the dollar you uh, tremendous yeah. productive assets uh, that will to your point you know generate cash flows for the next 20 years um you know because you know, for, for all our, you know, green and ESG uh, mentality, um, you know, the world still basically consumes as much coal today as it did five years ago and as it did 10 years ago. Um, and it will still consume as much five years from now. Meanwhile, of course, nobody's building a new coal mine. I mean, why would you buy a new coal mine when the the BHPs, the Rio Tintos of this world are trying to get rid, rid of theirs for one-time earnings? Um yeah, there's there's no point in building a new coal mine. So, no, look, I I think there's now coal prices have been soft, um, but you know, yeah, if either China starts to rebound decently, if India starts to rebound, um, or frankly, yeah, if Iran's oil infrastructure does get taken out, uh, Europe is going to be in a lot of trouble, and it's going to be starting to import a lot of coal for this winter. So lots of different ways this can play out. 
Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the reality is, I think with a lot of these coal names, you're paid to wait. Um, most of them have decent Absolutely. dividend yields. Um, and you're just waiting for the catalyst that at some point, these things are five baggers. 100% agree. Uh, Louis, you are headed for Australia, mate. You're, um, we're, yeah. we're recording this at the start of October, but you're, you're heading down here late October. What's, the, what's on the agenda? Yeah, I'm uh, coming down to meet with a few clients. Um, uh, I'm in Sydney the 28th and the 29th. I'm in Melbourne on the 30th. So it's just a three-day three day quick trip. On, uh, I catch the flight on the 30th at night from Melbourne back to Beijing. Um, and so, yeah, just, uh, just a, a quick three-day trip, which, you know, coming down from Hong Kong or Beijing to, to Australia, you don't get jet lag. It's a night flight both ways, so it's it's actually a pretty easy trip. So I come down, I try to come down a couple times a year. Um, to we we have quite a few clients in both Sydney and Melbourne, so it's uh, just nice to pop in, pick their brains for ideas, have an interesting discussions, and get back on the plane again. Well, nice. Well, I hope you uh, hope you enjoy your your brief stay down here. And uh, before I left, oh, I let you go. Um, please. Please tell uh, please tell the listeners uh, more about what you do there at, at, at GavCal and how they yeah, can get sure. in contact we're, we're uh, and, and get your research if they would like. Yeah, we're a bit we're a bit of an odd oddball of a firm. We do different things. We start as a research firm for institutional investors, and we have a number of uh, institutional clients around the world who pay us an annual fee to access all our research. We publish a number of reports every day. We have a strong. We publish mostly on China, but on broader emerging markets and and global macro in general. Um, and people can find out more on our website, uh, gafkal.com, G-A-V-E-K-A-L.com. Uh, we also manage money um, mostly in, into Asia and, and a fair amount into China. So we have China fixed income funds, um, Pan-Asian equity funds, uh, but we also have a Latin American fixed income fund. So we're you know, quite, quite macro-oriented, so fixed income is sort of natural destination for us. Um, and then we have a yep. that, that's our second business. And then finally, we have a private wealth arm um, where we manage money for for private individuals. That we don't have anything like that in Australia. Um, we we manage we we have a private wealth arm in the U.S. and one offshore. So we're not really set up to to manage private wealth in Australia. No problems. Well, I really appreciate your time today and uh, and and sharing your insights with uh, with all our listeners. So um, we'll leave it there. Uh, thanks again, and uh, and again, enjoy your trip to uh, Australia, and uh, hopefully you get a few more coal names on your list, mate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.